Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I'm going to be featuring a guest today by the name of Neil Gore. He's the founder of portaltoascensions.org, and we're going to talk about planetary shifts, UFO phenomena, advanced technology, and hidden truths. Dare to Dream show has been nominated for two people's choice of awards for a Webby Award, as well as winning the Coalition of Visionary Resources Award for the best radio and podcast show. Dare to Dream is listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. So thank you for being along for the ride. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane Here and Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world. You can find their classes or become a facilitator. Go to Dr. Dane Here, H E E R dot com, or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility specialist, and I I run a hub of visibility for you. If you're a light worker, you came here to shine your light and get your message out. I'm a book writing coach. I also take books to a guaranteed international bestseller status, and I do all the heavy lifting for you, and I show you how to be interviewed. So I've got a challenge coming up, and I know many people find me from the podcast, so join me, debbyd.net slash challenge. It's a five-day podcast interview challenge where you'll learn how to get a yes, a hell yes, on how to get booked on podcasts. Also, where are the right shows for you? Also, what do you do once you're on the show so that you're exquisite and you get massive results? When I help somebody get onto a show and become an amazing guest, we're talking about results like filling up your workshops, online or in person, like selling your books, like getting new clients, new followers, and more. So it is your time to shine. You can align with hundreds of the right podcasts for your message for bookings. You can have your media info ready so you're ready to go. Get the approach so you get a yes right away and start engaging with influencers. I have sent hundreds and hundreds of people just like yourself out there into the podcast interview world, and they're now successfully being heard on radio podcast summits, magazines, and more. Learn how to do it right, right from the beginning, and you can have massive results. The program is rolling out. Be one of the lucky ones to join. I can't wait to work with you. Five fast days, boom. You're going to be ready in the new year with this skill. Go to debbid.net slash challenge. That's debbid.net slash challenge. I'll see you there. So today I'm speaking with Neil Gore, who's the founder of Portal to Ascension. This is a conscious event production company that hosts presenters on a variety of topics such as the origins of humanity, the existence of extraterrestrial life, exposing hidden truths, and exploring the nature of reality. Neil travels the world facilitating gatherings and filming documentaries intended to empower individuals to reclaim their sovereignty and awaken to their full potential. Neil also operates an online platform that creates and facilitates 110 and more conferences and workshops per year. Portal to Ascension has worked with over 1,500 researchers, spiritualists, scientists, and consciousness explorers. Neil himself is a philosopher, historian, researcher, and spoken word artist. He presents his research on the ancient wisdom and future science of sound, vibration, and frequency, as well as in-depth explorations into ancient civilizations, archaeological discoveries, space anomalies, shedding light on hidden esoteric wisdom, and exploring ways in which we can create unity and peace on Earth. To learn more, go to portaltoascension.org. And with that, I welcome Neil to the Dare to Dream show. So great to have you here. Hey, Debbie. So good to be with you. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. Yeah, perfect timing. I know you're in the midst of so much, and we're going to tell people about the projects you're working on right now so they can join you. I know I'll be joining. And here we are. It's like a crazy, auspicious time, isn't it? Like, Mm -hmm. I know people are scared. I know people are unhappy. And I know many of us are like, cool, the underbelly is coming up and being revealed to be healed. It is a time of great awakening, right? 
So mm -hmm. with these planetary shifts, there's all these opportunities for us to awaken to our purpose, mm -hmm. why we came back at this time and took this upon us uh, with great confidence we could get through. So with all of that, what is your research on ancient wisdom? Tell us about where we are right now and where we're headed. What's the 411? Right, right. Well, see, that that kind of goes into why I even started Portal to Ascension, because the original reason was I wanted to find the root of all religion. So in essence, it was like a spiritual reason to like, is there a common religion? But wanting to go down that exploration took me down the ancient civilizations, like historic route, right? So I started researching into ancient history. And um, all of a sudden, I came across the Sumerian scriptures, right? Mm. The Sumerian tablets of creation. I would be reading different ancient scriptures, like um, like Bible. I'd have the Bible, the Quran, the Sumerian tablets of creation, the Bhagavad Gita. And I would highlight similarities within it. And as I was doing this, I started finding that there were some stories that were origin stories that all of humanity shared. Mm. And these origin stories, you know, these origin stories that are pre-creation that I found, which are before Earth even existed, and then these Earth origin stories. And a lot of these stories that talk about the history of Earth speaks about information, um, these individuals, as if they were at a really higher level of consciousness in many cases, that not only were they at a higher level of consciousness, but if you talk about the Sumerian scriptures, for example, you actually have um, evidence of quantum physics in there, metaphors used in order to explain wormholes and travel between dimensions and even the beings that the Anunnaki beings, how they got to earth. So it seemed that these ancient civilizations also had an advanced awareness of um, not only quantum physics that we're now rediscovering, but also really advanced technology utilizing their own human body avatars rather than external technology that, that they were completely in the know about. So this to me took me down the rabbit hole for like eight years from 2001 to 2008, where I started piecing together, oh, you know, our ancient history. And I started, I realized and I came across really quickly, uh, something called the Yuga Cycles in ancient India. Have you heard of the Yuga Cycles before? No, I have not. Mm -hmm. All right. So every ancient culture talks about different ages. And you might have heard, you know, the whole thing with um, Ascension in 2012, the golden age, right? right? People talk about us shifting into a golden age. So there are actually four different ages and every ancient civilization pre-flood, right? Pre like that existed because there was two major floods in the last 12,000 years. One that happened at the end of the Younger Dryas period at the end of the last ice age around 12,000 years ago. And another one that happened around 4,000 years ago. What we see after the 4,000 year ago flood was a progression of humanity linearly that we've been holding on to that we basically used to, to show that we were primitive and then we became very um, advanced from that, right? And which is why, you know, if we talk about ancient history and Egypt being maybe 12,000 years ago, we get um, we get individuals telling us or the conventional thing is, well, back in those days, we were primitive. So we see a evolution going on there, but all the cultures and civilizations, the religions, spiritual, you know, beliefs that were pre the last flood talk about time being secular. And they have these four ages in it. These four ages are, the Dark Ages, which is called the Kali Yuga in India, uh, ancient Indian texts. We have the Bronze Age. We have the, uh, which is the Dwarpa Yuga. We have the Silver Age, which is the Treta Yuga. And then we have the Golden Age, which is the Satya Yuga. So every ancient culture pre-flood talks about it. However, only India has an actual graph, a calendar with dates on it. And within this, if you put in like human... Um, origins and the timeline of our history, including great wars that occurred on our planet, they all fit in alignment with different transitions on this graph. And it's a 26,000 year cycle. So the whole concept is that we go through 26,000 year cycles of an evolution of consciousness and a devolution of consciousness. 13,000 years of the ascending, 13,000 years of the descending. And as we're, as we're doing this, going through these evolutions and devolutions, we're forgetting who we are we're forgetting our divine potential, and then we're remembering it. So the prophecies that we've heard, you know, 2012 prophecy, the Maya prophecy, um, Christian prophecy about the return of Jesus, right? Because Christians, I mean, um, they say the second coming is coming. And then we have, you know, the Jewish philosophy of the fact that Jesus wasn't the Messiah and the first coming is still yet to come. All of these different things that are talking about this now moment is actually a symbolization of the fact that we're in this upturn in consciousness. We've gone through this forgetfulness. And while we've been in this world of amnesia, where we forgot our true potential and our divine connection to source, 
um, we now experience the darkness that we needed to give us the contrast of the light that we truly are so that we can start going up in this ascension cycle. So that's to me is how like really all the history that I got into really connected to our spiritual evolution. Interesting. I recently heard that somebody was asking about an expert about the Mayan calendar and, mm -hmm. you know, Hey, 2012, should we be afraid? We, nothing really happened. And the, per the expert said, no, because they were eight years off. They misread the Mayan calendar. We are yeah. now going through what people thought was going to happen back in 2012. Right, right. So that means 2020, right, was the beginning exactly. of it all. And we know that was a huge year. A lot of things shifted, right? So, and it's interesting because um, it's almost like it's a period of time rather than just one specific date. Because what's happening within our galaxy is, you know, the whole 2012 philosophy, um, the whole 2012 theory of us ascending and all of that really connected to the position of our solar system within our galaxy. Because, you know, we have like, we have a, a lot of civilizations in the last 4,000 years that was sun worshiping civilizations, right? They worship the sun. And when you're worshiping the sun, it's almost like you're worshiping linear time because you're worshiping your relation to your sun, which is the construct of the linearity that we're within. But when you look at the Mayan cultures, the Aztec culture, the Hopi culture, you have, they, they use the term central sun. Okay. So a lot of people started thinking the central sun meant the sun in the center of our solar system. Right. But the central sun actually represents the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. And they used the central sun as the way for them to define time. So linearly, a solar system, we have linear time with our galaxy. Not only are we going around it in a big cycle, but we're also going through Fibonacci spirals up and down above and below the milk of the Milky Way galaxy. The flat plane, even though flat is even like a limiting word in space, the flat plane of our galaxy. So what 2012 actually represented and was proven conventionally, like a Russian space um, independent space agency around eight years ago said, we're entering the photon belt in our galaxy. And in this photon belt, right, this is conventional information. They said um, there's a very high concentration of ether and all the planets in our solar system are increasing in temperature because of the high concentration of ether. Because ether is actually an element accepted by mainstream physics. So... What happened in 2012 is, or that time, it, it represented the entrance of us back into the photon belt. So we were underneath the, the flat plane of the galaxy. We were going underneath it. And then we started hitting the photon belt in 2012. And then there's a period of time, a few years, where we're basically passing through the photon belt. And what occurs when we're doing that is basically it's a high concentration of ether, bombardment of cosmic rays, bow shock from the galaxy, just bombarding our planet, complete alignment with the black hole in the center of our galaxy. And then when we ascend, it's a representation of us leaving the photon belt and coming into, you know, the other octave of existence. So that's what it really represented in the Mayan culture because they were completely connected to the cycles of time that transcend our solar system but are more galactic. And do you have any sense of timeline as far as when we'll be coming out of this period? Yeah. Mm. So that so I my my COVID hobby was actually was <laughs> yoga cycles. <laughs> so I actually I got um certified as a teacher from Ananda College in yoga cycles, and because I really wanted to dive into because you can bring into everything like the reason we have everything on this planet right now has to do with the position of where we are within the cycle. So we entered this cycle, the Kali Yuga, from the Silver Age around 700 BCE. Okay, and a little side note. When you enter different cycles and you look at the calendar, you can look online, say Yuga Cycles calendar, you'll find it. And um, look at the incarnations of very important people around that time. They all happen right at the beginning of a Yuga cycle. Okay. So meaning like what happens a lot of times is avatars with the awareness of the cycle that we just left come down to earth to give you that information just so it, people have the opportunity to still be liberated in the matrix like the system. So, for example, Pythagoras, Confucius, and um, Buddha, were, they were all born 479 or 480, like within a year from each other. I'm sorry, 579, 580, which is right when we enter the cycle, and they all died within a year from each other too. Mm -hmm. So it just is a representation that many different avatars actually came when we entered the cycle. Then we went to the, the depths of the cycle, um, and then we kind of started going up again in um, the – ascending age however the ascending age was still within the kali yuga because all cycles 
are reflected on each side. So all four cycles are on one side, descending. All four cycles are on the other side, ascending. At the top, you have two golden ages connecting. At the bottom, you have two Kali Yugas connecting. So each age, to answer your question, mm -hmm. um, is twice as long as the other age. So Kali Yuga is like a thousand, um, I think like a thousand something years. I don't remember the exact amount. And then the Dwarpa Yuga is twice that. And then the um, Tretha Yuga is twice that. And then the Golden Age is twice that. But the Golden Age is doubled up. So not only do you have twice the other largest age, it's also doubled up. So which makes it even extra longer. So just to answer now what when we're leaving this age. So the time that we transitioned out of this age was in 1700. Every age has a theme. There's a 200 year transitory phase from one age to another. So from 1700 to 1900, we're in the transitory phase, basically moving from one from the Kali Yuga to this age. The theme of the Kali Yuga is the age of hierarchy and authority and delusion. Hmm. Right. So I don't really need to explain that. Or right. Maybe I'll just touch on the hierarchy element. You know, we give up our power to, to authorities. We don't realize that we can be our own sovereign beings. We're not even at a vibration to even be able to be our own sovereign beings. You know, we're living in victim mentality. And then we shifted into the um, Dwarpa Yuga. And the themes of the Dwarpa Yuga are energy, ideological communities, um, Energy and ideological communities. And I know there's one more theme I forget, but the energy element is what's interesting. What happened in 1700 as we started transitioning into this phase? Electricity was discovered. Light bulbs, electricity sweeping over the planet. Uh, made by people that were, a lot of atheists were in basically the ones that were finding the science back in, the, back, back in those days. When we hit 1900, all of a sudden, our energy shifts to the next level and we start getting quantum physics we realize that energy on the subatomic level, and then we have Max Planck, Tesla, and Einstein, all three very spiritual people. And now what the end goal is of this age as we shift out of it, which is going to be in 3700 3, CE, that's when we end this age, we become the masters of energy. And becoming the masters of energy goes from electricity to subatomic particles to realizing we are energy and then being the masters of our own energetic field before we go and enter the next age. Amazing. So that begs me to ask about space anomalies or advanced technology, because when you're talking about this, they, they start to come into play. What is it that we don't know? Those of us who are on the pulse of UFOs and extraterrestrials and are, follow all of this and are heavily involved with what's going on, but there's always new information coming out. What mm -hmm. is it that you're aware of that you can tip us off to? All right. So when it comes to advanced technology, well, there is definitely technology that is used by advanced programs, you know, secret space programs and different types of agencies around the world. And not even just secret space programs, but every country, for example, has their own super soldier kind of remote mm -hmm. viewing program. You know, mm -hmm. Russia has it. it's open source information for governments, a lot of this stuff. So there's a, a lot of technology that has been created that is reverse engineered things based on what has been discovered. You know, like, uh, for example, we work with Clifford Stone. Um, have you heard of Clifford Stone? No, tell me. He was a um, you know, military official. He was deployed to Roswell. He lived in Roswell until he passed away a couple of years ago. And um, he was actually on the UFO crash retrieval team for the U.S. government starting in the 50s, right? And he actually, so we we're at his house in Roswell and he showed us a manual um, that he had of the biological makeup of 17 different extraterrestrials and the type of UFOs they fly because there was so much frag um, so much um, material and even crashed UFO craft that was occurring all the time all over the world. The U.S. government had an actual program to deploy people there to reclaim some of this technology. May I ask you, yeah, Neil, though, just mm -hmm. to qualify here, when you say they crashed, did they yeah. crash? Because I know a lot of times the government will actually take out craft, space. Yeah, so so for a long time, I spoke about it in in um, by saying that they crashed because he was part of the crash retrieval team. That's just what the, that they called it, right? Yeah. And then just like a few months ago, um, uh, somebody else, another whistleblower came out talking about being part of this program as well. And he said, actually, a lot of these craft were, were called crash craft because they were just there on the ground, but they weren't even crashed. They looked like they got landed. They landed and were abandoned, almost like they were gifted to us for us to know what's going on, you know? That's so, 
Which is interesting, yeah. So now I haven't heard anything in regards to the U.S. government taking down craft from this planet. I have heard about things on Sirius and the government's interfering with them there. But the the it seems that that these craft could have been left there, right, for someone to find. Um, and now in regards to have we had an effect on crash craft, this goes back all the way to Roswell and San Antonio, New Mexico, because the first actual documented accident um, crash right was before roswell roswell was given all this intention and energy in order to take away from this other thing that happened two years before in san antonio new mexico when um the roswell crash and the san antonio crash happened within like hours after nuclear testing occurred right. Right. so the whole uh, understanding there was that the nuclear energy you know this goes into dolores cannon and um, the fact that after the nuclear bombs went off there was a call out to the universe and the call out was you need to come down to Earth. If you want to volunteer, come down, incarnate onto Earth. You can help change it, but you have to do it from within. So these UFOs, the reason for that was one of the powers, one of the energies on Earth that can really affect multiple dimensions is atomic and nuclear bombs because you're breaking the atom and that energy is permeating into other dimensions. Yes. So that is the reasoning behind these craft could have actually been affected from the nuclear explosions right next to them. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. That is so cool. Um, totally agreed. And I want to ask you also, you were, I love this thing that you were saying, super soldier. It's so crazy because you watch this stuff on TV. And what do you know about a super soldier and how would we know where they are and how they're operating? Mm. So this goes into the other component of the technology question that I wanted to bring it to, which was the real truth is that we are the most advanced technology and um, and the abilities that the human avatar have to transport ourselves and our consciousness and our physical bodies with just our own minds and our own being rather than using external technology, um, being able to levitate, being able to manifest things. These are all um, abilities because ultimately look at it like this. We're in a holographic um, universal expression of consciousness. Um, and within that, it's a very advanced organic computer program, if you will. And within that, you could change the programming to be whatever you want in order to create anything you imagine can imagine. And that is what the movie The Matrix is. Basically, you're stuck in this matrix, you transcend this reality, and now you can bend space time and stop bullets, right? If that is the case, and it's almost like all we got to do is change the programming, right? Um, the interesting thing is that the programmer, we're not only the people in the game, but we're also the programmer. But we forgot that we're actually the programmer. So we're basically like actors on a stage that don't know we're acting. Right, you know? exactly. So what happens is as soon as we start realizing this, we become that advanced technology and then we can start doing um, you know, many magical things. And I, I forgot the question that you just asked because oh, that was my segue into it. Do you remember? Yeah, no worries. It was about super soldiers. How do we okay. know where they are? What would indicate a super soldier was here and handled that situation? Yeah, so I can... Uh, I'm going to share a very little on this because I'm not the really the, the perfect person to ask this question for. I'll just give you my understanding of this program. And, um, you know, we work with lots of different speakers and we have people on that, you know, speak on this topic. But it's not something I focus on a, a lot because the Super Soldier program, a lot of these individuals um, have been really wounded, you know. And so from the people that I have worked with, they've been in programs in which they're um, different they are put to different types of traumas that create split personalities in which they're able to be triggered from different types of triggers that, you know, whatever agency wants them to have, where they can, they tap into whatever programming they're supposed to, you know, act out, right? So the super soldier program um, actually occurred um, through the MK Ultra program, but there was some before that. But what usually happens is, you know, if you look up MK Ultra, you'll see that it got taken, it got closed down. But usually what occurs is when, projects do really well they pretend to close them down and then they take them black budget and they start continuing this program you know off the books so many um children have been you know taken at taken at a very young age a couple of people like marina seren geraldine roscoe that we worked with have and then later in life some of them wake up to what has actually occurred and go through all types of hypnotherapy and different types of uh, modalities to transcend it now your question is how can we really know who is is you know the super soldier in the room right and honestly i don't know and i don't really focus on that 
what I do is like, I have seen some super soldiers come to some conferences, right? And then I was at Awaken Aware in 2008, Kerry Cassidy's first event, Project Camelot, and they had a super soldier come in and other super soldiers came, um, basically just sat in the crowd in order to observe what this guy was going to say so he didn't release too much. Mm -hmm. And that was called out by somebody in the room that could really tap into that energy. So there are those that are out there um, that can tap into and realize that. But what I will say is what you can do yourself is create a protective bu bubble of the higher frequencies and just know that you're protected all the time and move forward in that and not really have that fear that you're going to be attacked. That's kind of how I do it. I don't really give it the time of day, even though I do so many events, I really focus on the solutions rather than the problems. Beautiful. I love that. What a great tip. Really great tip. Always surround ourselves uh with a bubble and always highest frequencies, because that's not just for you kiddos. You're mm -hmm. also Im impacting the entire planet, which needs a lot of love right now. And everyone who ascends Seriously. their frequency is making a huge change. So, well, that's a perfect segue. Cause I wanted to ask you about music. I know you do mm -hmm. spoken word and I'm totally into sound and frequency and healing I've, I'm in a band called Lions of Lyra. I'm a oh, singer. Nice. It's beautiful. Love we that. do gigs, really uplifting music, and we do sound healings. I don't even like to call it a sound bath. It's a sound healing. It definitely is a frequency sure. changer and meditation. And so it's a joy spot for me. So when I learned that about you, I was super excited. Mm -hmm. So tell me about what that is for you. How does that manifest mm -hmm. that part of your creativity? All right. Well, I want to kind of share the story of how I even got into sound, yeah. right? Because it's it connects to the history thing. So when I started looking at the Sumerian scriptures, and then I started seeing um, translations of the Sumerian scriptures that these things that look like spirals coming out of like a planet with like a serpent coming out of it were actually sim symbols for wormhole travel and black hole travel from one being to another being. And, the, and a hybridization program that occurred between the gods and with a lowercase g and and humans, right? So I was like, wait a second, how are these ancient civilizations talking about quantum energy and, and wormholes? That doesn't make sense. So I started looking at my own religion I was raised in that I'd basically become an atheist to at, at this point, which was Hinduism, which is Hinduism. And I started thinking like, wait a second, is meditation, yoga, Ayurvedic diet, all these types of things that they're talking about here as modalities, are there actually ways to affect your personal vibration? Right. And so then I realized I started getting to the understanding that meditation is creating harmony within the body. And what is harmony? It's the fact that frequencies can be disharmonic and is bringing unity consciousness to that and creating some sort of um, balance. So, and as I started exploring quantum physics, I realized that we are all frequency, right? We've now proven, we've now quantified literally that you and I were not made out of solid matter. We're made out of subatomic particles, and these subatomic particles are vibrating in and out of reality always. So on the Newtonian level, you look like these atoms look like particles, but the what those Newto Newtonian atoms are made out of are vibrating frequencies. So therein lies the illusion. Why is it that I see something as solid, whereas if we get down to the subatomic world, it's a vibrating sound frequency. Yeah, it's but crazy. It's not just vibrating. It's, it's hair, and it's not hair. <laughs> you know, what else does that? Yeah. A hologram. It's exactly the way a hologram works. Mm. And we're basically piercing through the veil and realizing all things are made out of vibration. Mm. Now, this connects to sound because even there are sounds that are inaudible. Those are the vibrations. Right. And there are sounds, there are frequencies out there that are not audible that we're able to translate to a sound that our human ears can hear. So as I started understanding that we're all made out of frequency and vibration, this is the real reason why I got into everything I'm into, because I, I've started seeing that spirituality, consciousness, extraterrestrials is all frequency. And the reason why we can't perceive all the realms around us is because we're in a limited bandwidth of frequency. Our eyes can only see a certain amount of hertz. Our ears can only listen to 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, but there are frequencies that exist above and below it. So there could be a whole entire universe of experiences out there that we're not able to perceive because of it. And as I understood this linearly and, you know, because I was raised, um, I'm raised in an Indian family and we were really heavy on science and math growing up, you know, so, and computers. So I was like hardcore 
had to prove to myself that consciousness could be a real thing, like spirituality. So I got into that. And then I started really exploring the ancients and the ancient civilizations and the use of sound. And it, it, I came to the realization that so many ancient civilizations had an acoustic understanding of sound that they were able to make and have entire structures resonate at specific frequencies to cultivate certain experiences based on not even having a, an outlet, not even having some sort of generating device, but just using the earth's natural harmonics and the structure that they create to amplify these experiences from people. And that really was the beginning of it all. After that, I just started absorbing all things sound. I went deep into quantum physics and became a sound practitioner like yourself. You know, like I started going around the US playing didgeridoo, playing sound tools, but I would actually start out with a 20 minute presentation on the science and the ancient history of sound. And then we would go into, you know, the experience. Excellent. So do you, uh, Digidaru, that's a big deal. It's, it can be a heavy instrument also. Yeah. And very cool, very profound. Do you play music? Do, would you consider yourself a musician or a composer or more of a writer? Well, I'm definitely a writer. I mean, I wrote 2000 plus songs and poems and spoken word pieces. Wow. Um, I have like albums on like one on earth, one on like extraterrestrials, ether. So many different themed albums. Um, and in regards to playing music, I don't play anything that you need to be trained for. You know, <laughs> the, the didgeridoo, <laughs> like, it takes a while, but you can get it down. You don't really need formal training. And the Tibetan bowl, Anybody can do it. You just got to be patient, right? And not just ding it all the time. That's hilarious. <laughs> I, I love that explanation. I totally relate. I I am a not expert on the gong. We've got an amazing Tibetan mm -hmm. gong. We've got Tibetan double bowls, uh, djembe drum I play. Oh, nice. and yeah, so all of that. And hang drums I play, which I'm, oh, I love. I really mm -hmm. love. That's very healing. So uh, where can we hear your music? So I'm creating a, a hip hop album right now because my, my favorite thing to do is I'm a freestyle hip hop artist. So cool. like I can freestyle for a long, long time on different topics. And so that's my most fun thing to do. So I am creating an album. I have two songs done. I don't have them all done yet. By summer next year, it'll be out. Um, now, in regards to my poetry, you can go to SoundCloud. You can type in MC Resonance. Actually, no, here's the best place youtube.com slash mc resonance okay that's where i'm putting all my videos i just released three um spoken word videos i took in the guatemalan jungle because i was at a intentional community there for a month a few months ago and we recorded like three different songs one on atlantis uh, one on meditation and um one on ascension so those are like professionally created and then what i love doing is i'm going around the world and um, getting filmed on top of ancient sites and doing spoken word on ancient pyramids and things. So a lot of the videos on that channel are me on like different ancient pyramids, basically doing spoken word. It's oh, pretty fun. That's awesome. <laughs> oh my God, I can't wait to see this. All right. Mm -hmm. We're going to check it out. YouTube.com slash MC resonance. Uh -huh. Are you one of those that somebody can hit you with a subject and you can just start rapping? Yeah. I, I have only, I haven't met anybody, humbly speaking, 100%. I haven't met anybody in person that can freestyle as well as I can. and um, But I have, I do follow people online that freestyle way beyond me that are, are like kind of my idols when it comes to freestyling. Wow, that's quite but a skill. When I, I, when I was in the jungle in um, Guatemala just now, every week we'd have Kirtan. And then after all the Kirtan songs, we'd open it up. So we'd do like, um, we'd just have them all playing guitars and different drums. And I'd freestyle for like 30 minutes on different topics on like, different gods and Shiva, things like that. Okay. I love this. And I may have mm -hmm. to, before we, we end this a little bit later, I may have to ask you to do something for us. Just saying, right. putting it out there. Yeah, yeah. You can decide later if you're a yes or a hell no. <laughs> no I'm always intriguing. Down. Awesome. Good for you. You dive. So <laughs> you, you just mentioned you're going to, first of all, how much do you travel? Is it a tremendous amount around the world? Yeah. Well, I, so I separated with my ex-wife about a year ago, right? And even before that, we were traveling quite a, a lot, but we still had a home base. And then when we separated, I decided there was no reason for me to be in California. So I just began just traveling full time, no home base, just like wherever I want to be. I, I spend most of my time in Mexico because I love the Yucatan. I'm huge into the Maya. The Maya is like, um, mm. I've done like three hour, four hour presentations on the Maya history and 
And um, I like when first time I went to Yucatan, I wanted to kiss the ground. I felt like I was home, like it was wow. past life stuff. Probably you know? were, yeah. Yeah. And so over there also, there's only 5% pyramids excavated. There's always finding new things. So I spend a lot of time there. Uh, I was in Europe just recently. Next year, we pick up a lot because we're doing a lot of live events. We're doing um, two tours to Egypt. We're doing a conference in Glastonbury in England. We're doing one in San Diego. And then um, we have a few retreats. We have a retreat in Guatemala and all that. So the traveling is picking up quite a lot over the next two years. And then after that, I'm going to see where I want to be. Like, I really don't know where I want to live, where I want to be. I'm kind of exploring the world, the planet, trying to figure out where I want to call home. That's beautiful. Wow. What a way to explore it, right? To experience yeah. it. That's <laughs> firsthand. And so with you going to all these places, and I resonate with you with the Yucatan and the Mayan culture and the pyramids. Yeah. It's amazing. It's profound. Mm -hmm. Have you found archaeological discoveries that are shedding wisdom that could help us right now? So we all have the best possible outcome on earth or anything that was prophetic? Yeah. So, um, well, personally, so one of my goals in my life is to eventually be an archaeologist on sites, you know, doing mm -hmm. digs myself. Uh, and however, a lot of the people that you would even think are archaeologists within our community, Graham Hancock, Brian Forrester, and Michael Cremo, they actually aren't archaeologists. They are researchers of archaeological discoveries, right? So people do the archaeological finds, and most of the people that do the findings are getting grant money from governments, and they don't have an alternative, con they have a conventional view. So the researchers that go in there afterwards and they start dissecting it, they're more, I think, anthropologists, right? Kind of more like studying the culture, right? A a ancient anthropologists. So that's kind of where I am with it. I'm more of like a researcher of these ancient cultures. And however, I have been to some ar some archaeological zones and seen some things, right? So in Peru, I will talk about Peru for a second, but just give me one second to talk about Egypt. Because Robert Schock, he's a good friend, and he was at my conference a few years ago. And then he's also going to be at the one in San Diego in April at ascensionconference.com. And he actually is the geologist responsible for dating the Sphinx back to at least 12,000 years ago, which are around uh, five to 6,000 years older than we've actually been told, right? So there's a lot of things coming out of Egypt, and which is partly why we're going there. Because um, Egypt is literally like, it almost seems that, it actually, it seems 100%, because I've done a lot of research on this, that something happened on the planet Egypt was created as a, as a response to that, where a bunch of civilizations went and they coalesced and they started creating society again. And every part of Egypt has been created intentionally to the point that if anything ever happened to the planet again, you could rebuild the whole of civilization, including technology, including knowing the circumference of the earth and all this information just from the outline of Egypt, including how many bricks are in one of the pyramids, the exact amount of light years to Sirius A. Right? How many? Um, uh, what's the distance from this place to another place divided by the, dis the all three structures on the platform? The circumference of the Earth. Right. So, what I've, I'm hoping for within Egypt is that a lot of this information that is already out there becomes common knowledge, so we can start really understanding how advanced humanity is and reclaiming some of that information. Right. So, and the second thing I want to talk about is Peru. So, Peru is actually probably the number one archaeological site in the whole world. And I don't mean just one part of Peru. I mean like every single square inch of it. It's so amazing how many ancient sites and structures were there. It was a central hub for tens of thousands of years for culture. And so much so that you can go to somebody's backyard, start digging, and there's over 50% chance you might eventually hit something. Like it's like it was like almost all civilizations. And um, in Peru is, is, are where they found the elongated skull people. Have you heard of the elongated skulls at all? No, please. Go okay, so the elongated skulls, um, there's elongated skulls from around the world, but Peru has most of them. What we've been told by Peruvian government and then other mainstream researchers are this happened through cranial deformation. And this is a thing that used to happen back in the day is where um, different ancient tribes, especially the Inca, used to get two. And, you know, this isn't like we've done archaeological digs. We found the tools. We've seen the damaged children's brain um, skulls from it like this is a reality. They would get two planks of wood, put it on the top and bottom part of the brain. They would get some sort of stringy device so that they could um, close it out and just squeeze your brain together. And when you were born, they would put it on your head and then slowly 
uh, crank it as you get older and older to make your skull deform to be elongated. Okay. And the so reason a lot of for that was? Yes. So this is the reason. So they were, um, so this is what we were told was the elongated skulls. However, they are actually naturally um, formed elong elongated skulls. Mm -hmm. And the cranial deformation story has been used to put us away from the naturally occurred one. Mm -hmm. The naturally occurred one, there's so many that if you go to the main cath uh, cathedral in Lima, Peru, they're underneath the basement circle all the way around. You can go and visit them. So what makes them naturally elongated and how we know is that there's no signs of actual cracks in the skull or holes made like they usually do for these skulls. Mm -hmm. Plus, they have two suture lines down the um, skull, which we only have one. So it's a genetic anomaly. Mm -hmm. And at the back of the elongated skull, which is hugely elongated, there are two holes at the back of the skull. Why? Because their blood flow wasn't enough from the front of the brain. They had a whole entire artery system, vein system, to provide blood to the back of the brain. These beings existed within the last 10,000 years, and they're from Paracas, Peru. So whenever you go, wherever you go all over Egypt, you'll find some evidence or remnants of this. So the Paracas people, now here comes to your answer here. The Paracas people were actually um, the royalty in the Inca community. The Inca were the common people. The Paracas eventually, um, the Paracas eventually left. And, you know, we don't know if they got wiped out, something happened. And then the Inca continued to try to elongate their skulls in order to mimic the royalty that they were before. Oh, fascinating. Dear God, yeah. what we do to ourselves. <laughs> right. If it's not high heels this <laughs> lifetime, it's it's people drilling their heads and putting right. boards on. Wow. It doesn't sound like it was very successful to try to emulate. But no. is that because they had a different kind of, it sounds like when you're describing it or feels energetically like there was a different kind of brain power, but there was also a different kind of communication and intuition going on yeah. with all of that. But these elongated skull beings, right? Right. So now here it gets into like the deeper part of the story was that Brian Forster, who's the, you know, the researcher of that area, um, he had been trying to get the, the Peruvian government to allow them to take a piece of this uh, elongated skull to do a DNA test. And for years and years and years, they wouldn't allow them to do it until around two years, four years ago. And they did the DNA test. These beings aren't Homo sapien, but they existed with us, wow. and they were more they were actually more intellectual than any of these other beings. And mm -hmm. like little disclaimer is that conventionally we know that there were seven other Homo sapien beings that existed with us in the last three hundred thousand years, but we were told that they were all dumb and ignorant, like and didn't know how to do anything. And we, uh, you know, we actually outpaced them. So these along with the skull beings, we can see their culture, their pottery. They existed. They were the royalty. And the trippier part is that they had red hair and they weren't connected to any of the Alaskan land bridge native indigenous people. And the Hopi and the Maya have DNA connections to these beings. And then the last thing is their DNA haplogroup points to Mesopotamia during the time of Babylon in Sumer, the Anunnaki story. So, which then makes us think that these are the eventual offspring of the original Nephilim that hybridized with humans over multiple years and then took some sort of ship or whatever and then came to the Paracas Bay and began the culture over there. So that's one of one of the theories. And you know, I'm just throwing it out there, but there's a lot of evidence to back that up, especially looking at the genetic um, migration of those beings. Incredible. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you have spent a lot of time in Peru looking mm -hmm. into these things, your, your dream, uh, at the end, I'll ask yeah. you, what do you dare to dream? But that's definitely sounds like a dream you want to be on yeah. the site with these people. Can Robert shock get you in with him when he goes to these digs? Yeah. So when he goes to Egypt, yes, actually he probably can. So I know he hasn't been back in a while. He's starting up again, but what's happening now is a lot of these individuals are just taking tours people there and is there's a lot of things that are limited now when you go to Egypt. It's not really easy to get, you know, insight. So we're going with, you know, JJ Desiree Hertak? Yes, absolutely. They've yeah. been on the show. Uh -huh. Yeah, so they're good friends. So the two tours we're taking, one's the Stargate experience people, and then we're taking the second tour is, is JJ Desiree Hertak. So I'm excited to go with them because they are very spiritual. So they have a really good balance of archaeology with consciousness. 
you know what I'm saying? Whereas some other researchers really focus on just the historical evidence and don't tie in the spirituality as much. So I'm excited to go there and really tap into, you know, the greater picture of what these people knew about who we are, where we come from and all that. Yeah, absolutely. If I went, I would want to do the Hathor temple, find mm -hmm. the origin of Isis temple and yeah, that would be it right. for me. <laughs> that would I be just connected life. with a lady like yesterday that said that she touches things and she gets the images of what happened mm. at that time. And she's going to Egypt just so she can touch the different rock and get visions of what she was doing at those times. And I was like, well, that's pretty profound. <laughs> it is profound, man. You'd want to travel the world doing that. With Seriously, that. right? <laughs> with good lifetimes, benevolent mm -hmm. beings. Yeah. Yep. So before we get to the end, I absolutely want to shine the light on a couple of things. First of all, you're rolling something out starting on the 3rd, November 3rd, which is tomorrow. I know you've been hard at work. It's called The Truth of the Extraterrestrial Presence. Uh, that's a conference. And then mm -hmm. you're featuring the ultimate star beings, November 3rd through 7th. And the link is going to be in the show notes portal to ascension.org slash event and ultimate star beings conference. Can you tell us a little about that? Cause I know the people yeah. who you're speaking to, who are presenting, they are top notch. Many have been on the show and some I don't know. So I cannot wait to hear them speak. Yes. So about six months ago, you know, as I was creating the next series of events, I just had this huge calling to create one of the largest ET conferences ever. So it started with three days ended up becoming five days. And then we even threw in a free panel day, right? Where what's happening in this moment as we're recording, which is 12 hours of panels um, and for free on our YouTube that people can check out at Portal Ascension on YouTube. And then, yeah, tomorrow we start with the Ultimate Starbeans event. So the intention was to basically do a call out into the universe, put the lighthouse that humanity is ready to take the next steps needed in order to evolve our consciousness so we can eventually be in a reality with open contact with our collective community. Mm -hmm. And and however, part of that is, or well, a huge part of it is making contact with ourselves, right? So mm -hmm. when you look at these events, because we do UFO disclosure stuff, we do extraterrestrial awareness. Extraterrestrial awareness I hold as the spiritual understanding and UFO disclosure I hold as like the government things, what's going on in the mainstream. So this event is five days, 55 speakers, nine hours a day of nonstop consciousness and the actual experiences of these beings, right? And you'll soon find out, like we'll have stories of different planets and things like that for sure, but you'll find out, and most people listening will probably already know this is the case, is that these are messages from the stars, right? And these messages are how we can improve our own experience on Earth, create new institutions that are for the betterment of our all, but really doing the inner work that's needed for us to be at a place where we deserve to be the caretakers of this planet, mm -hmm. right? At this point, you know, technology, for example, is going exponentially. And it seems like human consciousness hasn't even caught up to the technology we're creating. So, but it's inevitable. This technology is going to be here. AI is going to exist. All these things are going to happen. What's the one thing that you can do in order to help change the world so that we use everything we're creating in a conscious way? It's by doing the inner work, releasing our triggers, facing our traumas, you know, um, expanding our consciousness. So this event is not nonstop, like five days of downloads with unlimited replay access with not only some of the most amazing luminaries on the planet, yeah. right? But also a lot of new people because over the last few years, you know, during COVID and everything, so many people just came up and started being at their highest level of what they really want to put out in the world. And so we get the opportunity to have a lot of the people that have been doing this for a while, but also introduce you guys to many new people that are coming out with their messages. Yeah, beautiful. So portal to ascension.org slash event slash ultimate star beings. But if you go to portal to ascension, you'll be able to sign up ASAP. I would get your name in there so you can reserve your seat. And there are replays. So for folks who are like, I'm at work or, you know, I've got meetings. Don't worry. I'm going to be doing both. I'm going to be there live and also replay and just nerding mm -hmm. out on all of that. And so we come to your conscious poetry or your rap. I must ask you if you would be so kind. And do I need to give you a theme or do you want to just riff? Yeah, give me a theme. Well, um, most of the time on podcasts, I just do something I already know. So this is the first time anybody's asked me to freestyle. All so right. let's do it. Mm -hmm. I like to do, um, I'm going to throw out a little bit so you have stuff to pick and choose from. I think that's good. Um, let's see, shedding wisdom, 
Um, also global shift and transparency. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, I use that term a lot, transparency. Okay. I am here on a mission. And that mission is to be shedding wisdom. But we all have the wisdom with inside our souls that we can let go. We know that we're all old souls. Let it come from the core of who you truly be at the center of this galaxy, this Milky Way galaxy, where we had so much anarchy for so long. But don't you hear the universe, the one song? Just playing to us inside of our brains, inside of our heart chakras, we were going insane. We were so much, so much people were so crazed because of the ways where we don't even know how to go through this haze, but life, Life is just another phase that will one day be replaced by an unconditional phase of pure love, pure energy, the one consciousness fractalized into multiple personalities. And now we are here. How do you want to be? How do you want to rift? Are you going to go through this global shift that has been created for us to uplift all of humanity? But not just humanity, also the plants and the trees and the animals and the insects that are beneath, but really on the same level because we're all here incarnated. We had various forms of devils. There were all these heavy metals. And now we just let it go so we can live in the now and just flow. Our souls have been in this construct for a long time, but this time we can break through and be part of the divine and source can come inside you because it was always there to start with. In the eyes of God and source, we're all just kids. All we want to do is just have the L-O-V-E, the love frequency, as we ascend to higher densities and we cultivate integrity and true transparency. Oh, you are out. Oh, that was so good. Thank you. I loved, I loved, I especially loved the different rhythms. I got to mm -hmm. hand it to you because you could have just gone, which of course makes things fascinating. You could have just gone yeah. and gone and gone, spoken so fast. But the fact that you would take that silent pause and then come in and do that line and then build it back <laughs> up. That yeah. was good. Thank you. That yeah, that's the spoken word. Slam poetry spoken word is like that. And then, you know, when I have a beat on, I freestyle more consistently. Mm, next time. Mm -hmm. Next time yep. I'm going to get you a beat for sure. All right. That'd be awesome. I could do just that. I could sit with you <laughs> and just listen to that. That is so moving. That'd be cool. Cause then you could just throw words out the whole time and I can complete, continue to shift. Absolutely. Oh my <laughs> God. That'd be so fun. You know, because my background before I did all this 15 years ago, I was a professional actress and singer. And so I had to do a lot nice. of improv. So I'm mm -hmm. used to that being on stage and having stuff thrown at you and just you're a yes, yes. and going with it. My God, I remember we used to have to do Hallmark mark cards and they would line four of us up. And the first two, uh, the first first person and third person had to rhyme, second person and fourth person had to rhyme and it all mm. had to be cohesive in the end. Wow. And man, you got to let go. You got to just be in that moment and let, because stuff comes up and it's right. It's yeah, accurate. Exactly. It's the, the right thing to say. You get right. out of your head and it's such a good skill. So bravo. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So darling, you are speaking at the Conscious Life Expo. Yay. February 10th through the 13th, 2023. Mm -hmm. You've been there previous years too. What are you yep. talking about? All right. So I'm doing two presentations. And the first one is on the truth, life, and times of Pythagoras. Okay. So that one's going to be really fun. It's, I've done a lot of presentations. It's literally my fun, the, the most fun I've ever had with any presentation uh, that's going to be a deep dive on the truth of Pythagoras. Who was he? What's all this mysticism? What do we have documented from him? The life? What was his life like? What was it before he got into this information? What kind of food did he eat? Because he was the first vegan documented in the whole of Greece. They hated him for it, right? So, um, and then also I'll just say he also was had a rare belief that we came back onto earth into multiple lives. And so we're going to go into deep information on Pythagoras, um, and then the other one is um, sound and vibration workshop. So I'm going to start. Yeah, that one's going to be really cool. I'm going to start with a 10 to 15 minute presentation on the quantum physics and, and ancient history of sound just to show like how legit this is. Right. And then we're going to do the rest of the 30 to 40 minutes. We're going to have a symphony of chanting. People are going to do alms at different levels. We're going to do seed sounds. We're going to be humming. We're going to create an energetic bubble because it's like the afternoon of Sunday. So it's like four hours before we end the whole conference. So I, what I want to cultivate 
and I'm actually in breath work training course right now to to maximize my skills for this workshop. We're going to do some breath work and do some chanting and just see what we can create together. Oh, How man, right up my alley. I cannot wait. That sound, both of them sound phenomenal for folks who want to go. I mean, this is the place. If you're a metaphysician, a spiritual folk from anywhere in the world, people fly in. I think they've got 15,000 people walking through the doors. It mm -hmm. is the, the thing I look forward to every year. I will be there. You can go live. And if for whatever reason you can't be there February 10th through the 13th, you can live stream it. So there's no reason to not attend. And that will also be in the show notes, how you can register right away. I definitely get your seat or um, your ticket for that. And Neil, this is Dare to Dream. I just want to give out your website again, portaltoascension.org for folks who want to participate in your amazing series starting tomorrow with all the presenters and then all the beautiful things you do online and in person. So what are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and your future goals? My future dreams is to have land to build a, co a community, a conscious community, a place where people can go, a place where we can really put into practice a lot of these things that we're learning. Uh, people can come to heal and to teach, you know, and also be trained to be the teachers of this new paradigm. So that's the eventual goal of Portal to Ascension. That was the vision from 2008. And so the productions that we create, you know, the revenue that comes in from these events funnel into our eventual goal, which is to rebuild society, actually like physically rebuild it for the betterment of us all. Beautiful. I'm now a fan of yours. I have so <laughs> enjoyed this time with you. Thank you for coming Thank you. on the Thank show. You, Debbie. I hope it's the start of more conversations in the future. Mm -hmm. And I end today's show with this quote from Charles Kettering. My interest is in the future because I am going to spend the rest of my life there. Thank you for joining us today. Remember to subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream show. Leave a comment. And next week's show is featuring Katrick Olson. He's a Viking. His expertise is in supernatural and paranormal, and he's got over 30 years experience. I'm very excited about that conversation. And if you're listening to the podcast and you would like to see myself and Neil, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger and join us there. I read all your comments. Thank you so much, everybody, for daring to dream and for raising your vibration to make this world so much better and so ready for all the good that is about to come.